So imagine you're traveling to a brand new city. You're really excited, but you have no idea what you're going to do when you get there. So let's take Seattle, for instance. Say you get to your hotel, you check in, and it's, a lot, it's around lunchtime. So you think, okay, I, I really want to go somewhere good to eat, so what am I going to do? Well, you do what you normally do. You get on your apps, your travel apps, and you look at TripAdvisor, Yelp, and Urban Spoon. You find the highly rated restaurants that you think look good, and then you decide on a place called Pike Place Chowder, because that seems like it's a great restaurant. So you get in the cab, and um, you start talking to your cab driver. And the cab driver tells you that he's from the area, and he's grown up there. And you kind of hit it off with the cab driver, and he's similar to you, so you want to take his suggestions. He tells you that the place you're going to is a terrible place. It's very commercialized, the food is expensive, and um, you won't like what you're going to eat there. So he gives you a local suggestion. You take it and you um, end up having the best restaurant experience you've ever had on a vacation in your life. So you think to yourself, what if I could do this every single time that I travel? What if I could get a like-minded local to tell me what to do in the city? That's what localsinthecity.com is. Traveling like a local rather than a tourist. We found that 76% of people use the internet as a guide for travel, and 90% of people rely on review websites to help them get through their travel tips. The funny thing is, is only 11.5% of people actually trust these review sites. They actually believe that these reviews are going to be something that they want to use. The main issue we realized is because a lot of times these um, reviewers they're not really they're not really um, reliable sources so a lot of times they'll actually be travelers themselves and they're trying to tell you what to do but they don't know the city as well as the local does also you may not necessarily relate to all the people on these travel review websites so Somebody may give you a review, but you have absolutely nothing in common with them. And we found that 66% of people feel like it's important to know the person behind the review and to know if they relate to them or not, if they have the same interests, if they're the same age, and they have the same marital status. <clears throat> so the first problem, in addition to unreliable sources, is there are too many of these travel review websites, and they're all the same. They give reviews. They don't give recommendations. That's a huge problem because a lot of times it takes a long time to shuffle through all of these different reviews rather than just having a direct recommendation given to you. It's time consuming and it's frustrating. The second problem is a lot of these are tourist traps and chains. This is really bad for the local economy because if these review websites are giving you tourist traps and chains as a recommendation, it can be expensive for the traveler. And on top of that, it takes away from the growth of the local economy. We found that local retailers return 52% locally back to their city, while chain retailers only return 14%. And when it comes to restaurants, 79% of local restaurants give back to the economy when 30% of chains do. This is a huge deal, mainly because now more than ever, it's so important that we support our cities and eat and do local activities. Third problem, all of these sites are very text driven. It's overwhelming to get on there and see a bunch of words. There are very few intriguing images. So as a society, we're going through a visual shift. We have become an image obsessed society. We wanna see pictures, we don't wanna see words. These current travel websites are not giving that to you. So the solution, locals in the city will give recommendations, not reviews. It will come directly from locals to um, travelers, and it will be because they're passionate. They want to share their city with locals. Also, we'll save travelers money, and we will boost the local economy. We'll provide beautiful photography because locals will be able to post pictures to their profiles. And overall, we'll decrease the overwhelmingness of travel. The benefits of the locals in the city. And the first one is the local perspective. You're finding that hidden gem that tourism websites and tourism guides do not give you. Locals in the city will give you, will help you find that one place that you want to talk about with your friends when you come back from vacation. I found this place that makes that made my vacation worthwhile while visiting there. 
The second win is that you will find out information from someone in that city who you relate to based on their interests. Whether they are a foodie, a bar hopper, they enjoy the local culture. If those things interest you, then you can relate and, and connect with this person and find out their recommendations for the city when you go and visit there. And the third one is it is user friendly. It's easy to create and update your profile if you are a local, and it's also easy to gather information about the city for travelers. It is very image driven. There are pictures, so you will be able to see what you are getting, not just words, not just stars. Actual visuals to show you where you will be heading or what you will be doing when you go to that attraction. So we stand out in the, in the crowded space of travel websites because we offer something that's truly unique, a user-friendly website where you can find the honest opinions of locals and local establishments of the things to do while you're eating and traveling. Uh, the customized travel information, which we have through preset categories like some that Brent had mentioned, comes straight from the people who live in the city. You can relate to these profiles based on the ones that they've self-selected and read their opinions about where they call home, which is verified by their zip code. And you can bookmark the information with colorful photos. Uh, although some of these other travel sites listed have some of the characteristics that we also share, um, we are by no means identical to any of these. The two sites that are virtually pretty new as well as closer to us are these middle two, Virtual Tourist and Traveler. But they don't come close to us because uh, their responses are not from strictly locals. You can talk about where you're from, but you can also talk about these other places. And so through all these things that we can offer, we incorporate the best aspects of what is already in cyberspace uh, for your traveling research, but put it in one place for your convenience. Our marketing strategy. This chef, who is from Tom Bistro, he is our promoter profile. Our promoter profile is from more of a key influences as part of our market strategy. So this star right here will show who is a promoter profile. Promoter profiles will also be part of how we earn our money. We will also have a featured photo on our homepage that will change frequently. And then once you click on the promoted feature photo, it will take you directly to the promoter profile. The, pro, the feature photo will change more frequently, probably around a month to every six weeks. So our pricing. We will make money two ways. The first way is, like Brittany said, group promoted profiles. These are some pricing packages that we have with our promoted profiles. So a local can promote their profile in locals in the city. When someone searches for a key term, foodie, bar hopper, local culture, these profiles will appear at the top of the page in a special promoted section. Now we will market these profiles to the owners of the local places. It will not be the restaurant that pops up in this promoted area. It will be the executive chef or the owner. This helps the people that are looking to go to places in that city to connect with the owner of that establishment, whether it be a tourist attraction, a restaurant, wherever they can connect with that local person rather than just connect with the restaurant. This helps um, travelers establish that relationship so they'll feel like they will know that person once they get to that city. So how can we make our money? Well, if we get two different places a month to get seven, the 750 promotions package, that is $18,000. $18,000 times 12 months, that would be 24 different places, that comes out to $216,000. And this is just for the city of Memphis, where we are starting. It can, eventually, we would like to go to other places, and so that $216,000 would multiply the times each city we would be in. So when we started, we didn't introduce ourselves, so I'm going to take a minute to introduce ourselves. Uh, first of all, we have Andrea Latard, who's all the way on the Right, well, I guess you're left. Uh, Andrea is our CEO. She started this whole endeavor as sketches and phrases in her spiral bound notebook. She's currently focusing on social media and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journalism. It's a tough phrase. But she spent five years as content editor and writer for varsity.com, as well as doing some of their social media for the varsity brands. 
Brett, Bill, Brett Bilbrey, his photo is on the bottom there, right here, is our CFO. He crunched all the numbers we needed to get locals in the city rolling. Brett has seven years of experience teaching and in administration at a private school, in addition to his specialty skills with new media and social media. Brittany, in our green sweater right there, is our marketing and sales director. She has worked on the market research to make sure that locals in the city stands out among its customer competitors. Brittany has four years of marketing and public relations experience, as well as she spent two years teaching technology in DeSoto County Schools, where her main task was to create technology-based lesson plans for kindergarten through second grade. And my name is Laura Fenton. I was our graphic designer. I created the chic and simplistic design of our website, which you'll see in a little bit, as well as our logo, and some of the other visual elements for our locals in the city. I have four years of experience in reporting, editing, and basic graphic design in the world of newspapers and universities. Progress. Locals in the city plans to launch the invitation-only beta version on November, 4th, November 14, 2014. We will launch the website of Memphis where we select. Oh. Um. Okay. Okay. Here is the mock-up of our beta version. As you can see, Brett is our profile here. He has his foodie, local culture, bar hopper, and then each of these will contain pictures and a small caption. Also, on the other side here is our home page, and up here will be the feature photo, and also the contact us at the bottom and how to sign up. Asking price, we're asking for $250,000. This will be to start us up in the beginning, pay for our sub servers, web design, maintenance, software and equipment, office space, and small salaries for four. All right. Local well, City provides a more personalized trip experience. Embrace your destination, immerse yourself in the culture. We are your local City, City, and we'll be around later on after presentation if you have any questions. numbers on how big this could possibly be? I know you looked at some, some numbers on the industry all together, but, but how big can this go? <coughs> this can go basically as big as we would like it to go. We started, we use our guinea pig to start off in Memphis, but we'd like to see it go at first to your top 50 major cities. And then from there, once we run there and get those, then go into some smaller markets with uh, you know, big tourist attractions and places that we feel that this could really be viable for those from that area. What we didn't mention too is we plan to start as an, a closed, um, an invitation only closed beta, which is similar to what Pinterest did. They invited only a certain amount of people. They were specific in the population that they chose. They wanted it to be hip, you know, people that would kind of get the get their website off on the right foot. That's kind of what we would do here. We would choose maybe, you know, I don't know, 100 locals in Memphis to be kind of our guinea pigs and test it out. If it worked out and we got all of the kinks out, then we would go to an open beta invitation only. So they would be allowed to invite 10 people each and then so on and so on and so on and hopefully grow it in Memphis to where eventually we could move it to bigger cities. And then in our phase two project, once we did that, we would like to see it where you could actually book your reservations to attractions or to restaurants through locals in the city. Once we did that, we would keep our promoted profile, but then we would also go to an affiliated marketing model as well to where businesses would pay locals in the city a referral fee or a percentage of the sale for every reservation or attraction that was booked through locals in the city. Okay, so that's good. I like those. I like the um, I like the mock-up that you did. So it showed some uh, creativity there. Uh, probably would have been good if you spent maybe just a little bit less on the problem and a little bit more on the solution, um, just to kind of get people right into this is how we're going to provide value. Here's the here's the benefits. You know, boom, 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 like that. Um, so I think you already did a good job of really getting into the problem and showing the demand there. Those types of things. Uh, other than that, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought, I mean, this, we talked in the beginning how they had a real challenge because this is obviously a crowded marketplace. I mean, there's a lot of travel related um, apps and informational sites, but I think you guys did a nice job in that slide showing how you do distinguish yourselves from those others. And I really like that, you know, reviews, not recommendations. I think that does resonate for anyone that's tried to plan a trip. But that is, you know, a difficult thing to accomplish. And I think you guys did a nice job and had really nice images on your slides. And you guys did really well. Alright. Online dating sites say that the perfect person is only one click away. But according to a study from the Pew Research Center, that's simply not true. For one thing, a lot of these the systems reduce people to nothing more than piles of information. It takes the humanity out of online dating. And also, it undermines the true fact that compatibility actually results from face-to-face -face social interactions. Secondly, those claims that those matchmaking algorithms that they use are perfect are simply just self-reports. There's no transparency on how, those, on how the procedures or methods actually work. So there's no outside source to actually back up what they're claiming. You're not getting a fact, you're getting an advertisement. And thirdly, while all these matchmaking systems are preference-based, preferences is not simply going to equal your perfect, your, your most compatible date. You might prefer a non-smoker or a Republican, but there are, with online dating, there are always exceptions. 33% of online daters aren't looking for a serious relationship. An additional 33% wind up abandoning their profiles for whatever reason. I guess online dating just wasn't for them. But let's take a look and see what some would-be online daters have to say. I've never used them since I'm too young to be concerned with the deep levels of compatibility they advertise. They always look like a place for people who are trying to get married and know exactly what they want. Also, it would be embarrassing if my friends found out. And then there's this guy. I don't want to become somebody's skin suit. <laughs> Needless to say, household names that are that are dating websites like eHarmony, Match, OkCupid, they get a bad rap for being unsafe and unnatural. Of the 109 people we surveyed, 70% said so there's still stigma associated with online dating. Those respondents went on to say that online daters are perceived as desperate and that meeting somebody online just isn't real. Existing companies are thinking globally, but they're not acting locally, and this leaves customers feeling uncomfortable and uncatered to. It's true what they say. First comes love, then comes marriage, not Google. But what comes before love? We think Draft 901 does. So Draft 901 takes a group of three friends, compares them up with another group of three friends, and gives them the tools to basically have a fun night on the town. Basically, one person grabs a couple of buddies, and they create a group profile. They can then rate other group profiles either by finding by browsing through our site or by looking at suggestions that we've given them based on general interests. And the benefits of Draft 901 are that your friends verify your identity. You don't need to worry about being catfished or that someone you go out on a date with is going to be lying about who they are or what they like to do. The group dynamic means that the uncertainty a lot of people feel towards group dating is gone. It's another night out on the town with friends. And instead of having to walk up to some random stranger at a bar and strike up a conversation, you're going out with people who already have common interests and you know are going to want to meet new people. Whatever you, whether you walk away with a romantic connection or just a few new friends, it's a win-win situation. You have a fun time and you gain a few new contacts. And this is a mutually beneficial relationship between our partner businesses and ourselves. They get free in-house advertising and we send out emails to our customers reminding them to rate these businesses on Yelp. In exchange, we get offerings for user, free user deals like free appetizer or free round of drinks. And one in every $10 is spent on a website this year came from a smartphone. One in every, one in 10, internet users have visited the dating site, and with smartphones, this goes up to two in every ten. This fact makes it crucial for us to have a mobile app. And our site layout was inspired by social media. It's going to be a place where members can share pictures and videos, as well as humor stories. Online dating is a billion dollar industry, so it's no surprise that we're going to face a lot of competition. 
but we feel that Draft 901 has the solution to rise above the noise. Obviously, we have our heavy hitters, our household names like eHarmony, Match, Plenty of Fish, and OK Cupid, but they're all plagued with similar customer complaints. First, Match and eHarmony lock their customers in with contracts. <laughs> Draft 901 is pay per use, so when our users feel like they've outgrown our services, we're not still dunning them for money. E uh, plenty of fish and okay keep it don't do a great job of weeding out the creepers. We don't provide a messaging service and we also don't allow our user information to, uh, to be released without your consent. Therefore, our customers feel safe, secure, and in control of interactions. There are a few local groups. There's Grouper, which has a similar premise to us. It has 17 locations, one in the Mid-South, and that's Atlanta. The difference between Grouper and Draft 901 is Grouper only matches one set of people out of each group. That leaves four people with absolutely no say in who they're going out with. And finally, there's the Kim Hill Agency. It's based right here in Memphis, but it's a high-end matchmaking service. The cheapest you're going to get out of Kim Hill is $250. Obviously, Draft 901 is having a much better price point. And Drive Meadow 1 wants to focus not only on getting new customers, but elevating the experience of our older customers. And this comes through our extensive, extensive use of social media. We want to have photo and video campaigns among our members so they can post their best experiences that they've had on our dates. We get free advertising by this, and they are able to share fun times with their friends. And Drive Meadow 1 will work to maintain a strong physical presence in the cities that we offer our services to. This will be a great way to advertise to future customers through interaction. Here's a few examples of successful graphs. <laughs> and a few things that we will do to maintain a strong presence are have bar crawls, wine and beer tastings, theme parties like having a Mardi Gras party or a St. Patrick's Day party, and an event called Draft Midtown where it's a festival-like celebration downtown and we can have local bands, we can have our local vendors that we use, and everyone come down and have a great time in the public eye, and it's going to be a great advertising. Most importantly, Draft 901 is pay per use. It's $20 per person per day. But don't look at this as money down the drain. It's money well spent. You're getting something free every $20 you spend. Whether it be a free round or a free appetizer, you just put a down payment on a great night out. And our partnerships with local businesses provide in-house advertising for them in exchange for customer discounts for our customers. They will also get preferred venue status, which means that every time a customer on our site wants to go on a group date, we will put these preferred venues up in front of them first. We'll also use promotional pricing for Groupon and Living Social to get our business started off the ground because they're very popular sites. Now, there's definitely some money to be made in online dating. As stated before, this is a $1 billion industry. It's also recession-proof. For example, in 2008, there was actually an increase in online dating membership, uh, memberships. Annual mem membership revenue per user is usually 239 for major dating sites. There's also currently 40 million uh, users. Also, uh, Rupert, which is uses a, a pay system that's similar to Draft 901, actually cash flow positive in less than three years with 17 locations. We plan to launch in Memphis, but shortly after, we'd like a five-city rollout to include Nashville, Birmingham, Charlotte, Orlando, and Atlanta. Ideally, we'd like to see this accomplished in a year and six months. If we can do this, if we got 10 drafts per week per city, that gets us 60,000. Per year, 360,000. And that's only 10 drafts a week. It could be more. And I'd like to take a second to introduce our team. We've got Rachel Wilhite, obviously is our well-rounded ginger. We've got Calvin Carter over here, who really likes lightsabers. And I am Lauren Turner, and my favorite date would be to get on a TARDIS with Dr. Who. So the progress we've made so far is we've talked to about four different locations in Memphis who are very interested in becoming a partner with a business like Draft 901. Owen Brennan's, The Dublin House, The Green Beetle, and Spin Heaney. And through these, we are going to have a solid network base of business partners in the area. 
So what we need is 350,000 to build a website, mobile app, and custom software that will put us on a competitive level with other major online dating sites. So, in rendezvous with two of your closest friends, meeting some new people, and getting a free drink is more your speed than an intimidating, intimate, candlelit one-on-one -on -one date? Then give us a chance and see who's on draft. We can't promise that you'll find true love, but we can promise you'll have a great time. Thank you. So I thought overall it was really good. I thought you guys set some like really good context, so to kind of let everybody know you did your homework. Um, probably could have done a little bit better job of detailing certain things in a little bit better order. I was getting answers to certain questions as you went further, but it would have been good to hear like the better description for the group element, like the way you summed it up at the end. It would be good to hear that in the beginning, because I thought that provided even more clarity to when you're going through your examples. But all in all, you were able to answer most of the questions that I was developing throughout the presentation. Um, I'd be careful saying things like, you know, recession proof or full proof or things like that, because you know, just you never know. You might be recession proof, but you might not be, you know, on the flip side. When when times are good, you might not be, you know, be able to prove yourselves during those times. Because maybe because it's a recession, people are resorting to being online and trying to filter out through filter through the weeds that way before they take a shot. You know, so just keep in mind those little things. Um, I thought it was very good that you went ahead and talked to some of the restaurants. Um, We'd love to hear more about that. I know the owners of several of those, so it's just kind of interesting um, what's going on there. So you already had some, some data, some real anecdotal data to kind of back things up. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So overall, I thought it was good. Yeah, I was curious too. What, how some businesses seem receptive to this as um, being something they be? I kind of pulled some strings and said to Lauren with Ellen Brennan's. I used to work at Spendini. My best friend owns the Green Beetle, okay. and my best friend owns the Double House. Oh, so I was kind of, they <laughs> have to listen to me constantly <laughs> complain about grad school. And this actually wasn't a complaint. So I'm sitting here telling them, this is my idea. Do you think you'd be down to do it? Like, sure, we can figure something out. Mm -hmm. It might not be a completely free round. But we could get a discount, we could get a coupon, mm -hmm. it could be cheap wells. I know from working at Spendini, there are times we're trying to get rid of like seasonal wine. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, I thought um, you guys had a really polished, this was very well written. I mean, I think short phrases like down payment on a great night out and things like that really help this connect to your audience really well. And I did really like all the evidence of all the research, which is what Andre and I both talked about a lot, that you did your customer discovery, you talked to businesses, you had actual statistics about how people respond to this. I mean, I think that makes this a really, really um, powerful pitch um, and, and really smart. I mean, the fact that 70% of people particularly, and that doesn't surprise me in this town in particular, but still think that there's that stigma associated with it, I think that really is, you know, a powerful argument for what you're doing. Um, yeah. I bet it increased because we did survey 109, but it only gives you a percentage for the first 100 people on SurveyMonkey because we're broke and have to do a free uh, Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Our 350,000 could get us a better survey. Yeah. <laughs> and I like both of these groups did a nice job of, in your revenue estimates, you sort of pointed out, like, even if we only got a relatively modest amount, we'd still be pulling down, you know, a decent amount, which I think is a good... I mean, you're trying to pitch to investors. I think you made a kind of persuasive case so that that's a good thing to do. So, any other questions or comments about this one, Joe? Guy, yeah, I thought the writing was really good. I was perplexed by the the draft midtown example. You talked about going downtown. I thought isn't the whole point to be in midtown? Oh, did, did sorry, that was a slip of the tongue. Oh, okay. we would like to have two events: uh, draft downtown and draft midtown. Okay. We would like to have as many public events as possible because if, if we can do festivals like that, we can get our name out there and really start to, because another thing that we wanted to do, the reason we called it Draft 901 was because we wanted to highlight you know, places in the city that a lot of people don't necessarily know about or go to. So, And we also feel like having a strong physical presence allows us to further eliminate stigma. If you see a bunch of people having a great time like at Holland Fest yesterday, you're not going to think these people are rejects or losers. You're going to be want, want to be with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think what all these groups have that's powerful, which was part of the point here, is one of your differentiation points, and that was true for locals in the city too, is your ability to market this. 
which is not, you know, that's not the end all be all, but that's an important element of this. And I think, you know, as journalism students, that's what you bring to the table. Um, for those of you that haven't been in this class, you know, we had some flexibility this year, sort of as an experiment. Um, I mean, in class, we talked all about um, disruption in journalism. Um, you know, and that was what all of our lectures were about, and much more media focused. But you know, I didn't dictate exactly what their startups had to be because I wanted them to kind of experiment and iterate and do things they felt passionate about. So they're really bringing home a lot of strength on the the marketing piece of this, which they don't get into as, in as detail in a pitch. But you know, but that's one of the things the journalism students we also really bring to the table is we have that experience to write well and, and market this stuff. So just in case everyone's wondering why these aren't all hyper-local news sites. Because um, I could have had I could have made them do that, but we were a little more flexible. Good job, you guys. <laughs> turn it off. We're team Turn It Off and we're here to power on your productivity. Our app takes the cluttered distractions of social media, text messages, phone calls, and alerts out of places that need your full attention. The problem now is that students, more than ever, have cell phones in the classroom. They're distracted, and this could lead to missed assignments, um, missing important announcements, and they could also be reprimanded and have their cell phone take away, which doesn't make mom and dad, who paid $400 for that nice new iPhone, very happy. So, why is this such a big problem? 78% of teens now have a cell phone. That means almost half of them own smartphones. And this has gone up in recent years and it continues to go up. Teens on average send uh, 440 messages per week. 110 of these text messages are sent during class. 65% of these teens use their cell phones in the building despite an anti-cell phone in school policy. And 35% admitted to cheating on a test at least once because of their cell phone. So, Memphis classrooms have become our, bottle, our battleground against distraction. Um, they have, Memphis City Schools have constantly struggled with retention rates and graduation rates. And they've always dipped below state averages. Our app, although it's not the ultimate solution uh, to this problem, will help teachers control the classroom and give the power back to the teacher's hands. It eliminates frivolous multitasking, which can actually lower your IQ by 10 points, which is if you decide to use drugs or skipping a night of sleep, like I did last night. <laughs> it also creates harmony with the technology and classroom instruction. Teachers can distribute quizzes, uh, homework assignments, and um, other assignments with this app without um, worrying about students being distracted by Facebook or Twitter. And parents can also have a peace of mind about contacting their kids instead of having to jump through hoops with school administration to contact their child if there is an emergency. Now I'm going to kick it off to David, who's going to break down the tech specs. Okay. Turn It Off is comprised of three main areas. The app, the web interface, and the back end. The app, which is installed on the student's actual cell phone, turns off internet and text message services while still allowing incoming and outgoing phone calls in case of emergencies. The web interface lets teachers and schools push content to any cell phones running the app. The back end is where the data is stored and managed securely to protect privacy rights. The app, as you can see from this first splash page, that the students will see when the app is active in the class, allows for them to view things such as breakfast and lunch menus, class information, emergency notification, school news and info, and any other content, audio or video, that the school or teachers wish to push to the phones. The interactive splash page that you'll see on the right is what a student would see when a teacher is using their phone for educational purposes. The student would have the ability to take quizzes and surveys, look at some grades, progression in class, or even some class files. The web interface is the same for both the school and the teachers, as you can see here. From the school standpoint, they're able to do things like send out the emergency alerts, should somebody invade the school or anything of that nature, update menu items for what is in the cafeteria for the day, school events, PTO meetings, any other information, and also do something simple like put the weather up. 
As you can see from the left side here where it says instructor controls, this is the teacher's interface once they've logged in. They can do things such as check the phone statuses for the students in the class, change the settings at will, do simple things that help progress along in the class such as a roll call, surveys, quizzes, and tests, and also send quiet emergency notices to the students should there be a need for it. On the back end, as you can see from this cloud model, the web and app itself talk to the servers at the data center. They don't communicate directly. GPS and Wi-Fi that's on the student's phones while the app is running allows for the app itself to know that the, school, that the student is on school ground and that the app should be activated. The student's class schedules will be uploaded to the server where the content of the school is housed so that they will be able to distinguish between which class the student is in so that specific teacher will have control over the student's phones that are currently in their class. From a technical support standpoint, the support is provided to the teachers in the schools via live chat, email, and phone support. Uh, the servers themselves will be housed at a very secure data center for privacy laws as the information that will be on those servers would be both school records, school information, and students. Now, I'm going to pass it off to Tyler for the two C's, customer discovery and competition. Customer discovery. School districts are our customers, and teachers are our clientele. The students themselves will be the only ones who will download the Turn It Off app to their smartphones. Students will benefit from the app because it will allow them to focus better in class. And it's very important, however, to remember that teachers must be sold on this app idea. The feedback of parents, too, is important. After all, it will be counterproductive if we discover that parents were opposed to turn it off. We need the support of both teachers and parents if the Turn It Off app is going to take off. We used social media outlets to send out two surveys, one to teachers and one to parents. Here are our findings. And we'll start with a representative quote from a teacher. Okay. Six out of nine teachers use apps as part of their classroom instruction. Nine out of ten teachers reported that either their own school or the school system they are a part of allocates funds specifically for new technologies in the classroom. Ninety percent of teachers surveyed think that cell phones are in fact a distraction in class. Seven out of ten teachers use smart devices as part of their classroom instruction. Seventy-one percent of parents and other adults believe students should be allowed to have their cell phones in school. And ninety-six percent believe that phones are a distraction in class. Parents, that is. And now I'm going to talk about competition. The iPhone iOS comes equipped with a way to turn off notification and has a do not disturb option in settings. However, students can allow calls from favorites and this of course includes emergency contacts. The problem with this is that students would have all the power and teachers would have to trust them and this is not ideal. Turn it off empowers teachers. Now, Turn It Off Keys Competition uh, is web filtering software like Browse Control and Barracuda. We also have to worry about cell phone jammers and signal blockers. Okay, so Browse Control and Barracuda are not apps. Uh, they are used in office settings, not in school settings. The web filtering software is used on company computers for the purpose of presenting, of preventing, that is, employee funny business. And now I'm going to kick it off to Tiffany, who's going to talk about financing. Okay. Through the business parts, we will have 100,000 
bootstrapping and we will ask 400,000 more from angel investors. So totally we will have 500,000 for our startup. And how we promote our apps at the beginning, we will uh, offer the premium models to school for 30 days and after that they have to pay, uh, they will be charged 50 dollars per student. Why we do this? Because according to the result of our research, the teacher said this way will make them much more e much easier to accept the new technology. This is this chart will give you a basic idea about how we use the money uh, for our companies, our staff and our products. This is our uh, five years business plans. So we are gonna to start um, our apps from Memphis. You can see there are 28 private high school in Memphis. So um, on the first year, we want to cover four schools. And after that, we'll, we will add eight more schools um, each, we will add eight more schools each year. And on the six years, we will cover 36 high schools. And and then you can see it's, we will uh, earn more than six, 600,000 on the fifth year. Um, and this chart will show, will show you guys about the cash flow and fifth year in these five years. On the first year, we, um, we still lose some money, but it doesn't matter. On the second year, we began to earn. So in order to attract um, the investors to give us money, <laughs> we will offer them 20% 20 20 of our profit each year. And um, in, this, in this five years, we can pay, pay them back a little more than half of the investments. And besides this, we also give uh, our investors 50% of our ownership. And on the, uh, in the fifth years, we will begin to expand our markets. We will try to expand um, to sell our products to public uh, school. And also, we will promote our products to other uh, private, uh, private schools in other cities. So this is our whole five years plan. We want to um, offer this five years business plan to give our uh, investors a clear idea of what we will do in these five years. This is our team. Yes, this is our team. I'm Amy Gregory. I'm the CEO. And, and I guess Bernie shall uh, uh, turn it off. David Morris is our CTO. He's our tech guy. Uh, Tiffany, she crunches our numbers. And Tyler, he keeps us all pumped and motivated, and he's in charge of uh, business development. And remember, we're Team Turn It Off. We're here to power up your productivity and your profits. So thank you for your time. Once the students have the application turned on, they'll be able to see which students are logged in. That also helps them take attendance um, as well. And they'll be able to essentially power off uh, their notifications. And would y'all, I'm assuming uh, that y'all would have like something sent out to parents to tell their kids to actually download the app and to get parental, you know, uh, I guess. Well, the idea is the app is part of the code of conduct for the school, mm -hmm. you know. They all have current cell phone policies that say, hey, you know, no cell phones at school time. So by integrating this and giving each individual student like a 16-character ID for their phone attached to their account, it allows for all that data to be shared privately. Mm -hmm. And also, it also makes it so there's a comfort level for both the school, the parents, and the student. I mean, even though the students are really getting a short end of the stick. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if the parents would be okay with that, if they have a say in, you know, the teachers actually, you know, kind of accessing their child's phone. That's kind of my only 
Well, um, that's why we initially wanted to start with private schools. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> private schools, they they can, um, I guess, foster around parents and, and kids a little bit more. Um, and we wanted, that's going to be our beta. Start in Memphis private schools and see how it does there and then eventually expand to public schools. Just to be clear, Brittany, the app is the, the actual thing that's controlled by the web interface. Yeah. So that... There's no real control over the phone, it just simply stops the phone from mm -hmm. doing certain things that would be distracting in the class. Yeah. So, I mean, I totally understand because, like, your teacher can see your contacts and your text histories, but all that privacy is, is yeah, legit. Other? Sure. Um, so, I think overall, it's a very good presentation. A um, few things here. Uh, I was happy to see that you developed and you were able to see that you actually have three customers. Uh, that you have to think about and think through. I think you could have done the discovery piece earlier. Um, so when you're laying the context, I think the flow would have been a little bit better if that was done earlier. What happened was, uh, I liked how we kind of jumped into it. Um, then you really got into the solution and the interface, which is really good. So after that piece, it wasn't right to have the discovery flow after could have just kept moving right into how we're going to make money, how we're going to do that. So not a big deal, but just flip it. Um, I like the fact that you actually, you took a guess, right? You took a guess on, on what you thought you could do over X amount of years, um, which is good because you have to lay it out there at, at some point. Um, still questioning the, the 100,000 bootstrap model, you know, not a big deal, but I would just put it out there. I would just say, hey, we want $500,000 and that's what we're looking for now. I wouldn't worry as much about trying to prove in X amount of years before you get funding. No, make the case right now, let's do it. But I'm happy that you have made a case, right, and put it out there. Um, I also think that uh, I like the feature with the GPS. Um, I thought that was pretty good. Um, good mock-ups and demo shots. Uh, definitely didn't have to get into that much detail, uh, but it was good that you did. Um, I think one other thing here, I don't know in that whole beginning model, 36 schools, I think was the first, um, I can't remember how many, year, how many years you had on that. Five. Five years. I would just think bigger, right? I would just think, how do I go way bigger than that? Because what you're talking about, I don't think you're going to have a super, super long sales cycle. So, um, but overall, that was a great presentation. Good job. customer discovery um, you know they were the only group that was essentially not marketing you know to us <laughs> sort of I guess um, you know and my reaction to this is like you know I try to keep, get my students to keep their phones on because I'm usually making them do social media or something you know um, but every even my friends that are teachers all were like oh I really like that idea or parents actually liked it as well like that's great that sounds awesome me yeah bro. as you say um, as a teacher at a private school they cuts their kids' hair for drug testing, I believe you will uh, <laughs> yeah, I believe you will not have a problem as far as integrating something like this into a code of conduct at a private school. Yeah, so, yeah, so. I mean I, we don't physically cut them, but they, they're randomly drug tested and it's a hair sample in state. So Yeah, if you can do that, you can download it out. That's <laughs> true. And the only thing I would add, the last two groups, I mean, I would t just slight, I mean, you don't want to go on and on, but like maybe just slightly more, I'd talk yourselves up just a little bit about like why this group did a good job of being like, you know, this is why you should invest in me, because I hear a lot, you know, that investors care as much about the people as the idea. I mean, not a ton more, but maybe just a hint more of your, what makes you a really good person to be, you know, doing this, with your background. I'm just saying I look shifty and I need to offer explanations. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I did. Well, but you're not. You're not. You're not. You've got kind of a creepy face. It's like Tyler has very cheeky. I love it. Yeah, Tyler does look very cheeky. They're very good. It was intentional. <laughs> well, if, uh, if no one else has any other questions, um, these groups have really done amazing work. I really, you guys don't know how much I appreciate students that work hard, I really do. It makes me, um, makes me very happy um, because they don't always do that. Um, so it really, it means, it means a lot to me personally. It actually really does. I'm not just saying that. So A is for everyone, right? A is for everyone, yes. Um, and we will all be having a little date for New
your tweet up over at local, which is right sort of around the block over there. Um, everyone's welcome to join us for a little conversation about entrepreneurship or, and good times. So. so I was just going to add. I mean, I think the whole, I mean, the whole premise of kind of starting to do these types of classes were to you know, kind of prepare students for after school, right? I mean, we know the whole economy is shifting on us all the time, um, and the kind of way you have to prepare yourself is much, much different than maybe many years ago. And so we're just hoping that by, even though we're not really prototyping and building out technologies, but we're hoping that we introduce you to the business model, the discovery process, the problem-solving mentality, you can apply this type of thing to anything, right? I mean, it doesn't just have to be a company that you're starting. It could be a nonprofit job that you're working, a corporate America job, you could be working in government, but if you're always looking at trying to solve a problem, trying to look at three to five key benefits that you bring to the table, how to organize your thoughts, how to give presentations, how to go out there and test it and validate it in the community, these are all things that you could use at any job. Um, these are tools that we use with not just entrepreneurs, we're working with a wide variety of companies and organizations in the city here who are seeking out these types of principles. We've even had people from some of the classes last year who are using this in their day jobs today. So, you know, just trying to change it up a little bit, and you'll be surprised how you might revisit some of this uh, somewhere down the road. So I think it was a very good job. Yeah, there you go. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.